About one minute. Board all set. Good evening and welcome to the June 15th, 1993 Town of Cape Elizabeth Planning Board meeting. Uh, the first order of business this evening is the Approval of the minutes of the previous meeting. Are there any comments or corrections to the minutes as presented? Sue, Mark. Do I hear a motion? Judy. Mr. Chairman, I propose we accept the um, minutes as written. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any other discussion? All those in favor, uh, please raise your right hand. Opposed? Minutes are accepted as written. Good job, Alice. The correspondence, the list of correspondence this evening, um, the first order is, is a letter from, I believe that's Peter Malia, uh, although it doesn't look like a P, um, to Maureen asking that the uh, Beals ice cream application be moved to the July meeting. Um, I'm not sure whether this is proper to discuss this at this time as, as far as typically when we vote to a, to a specific date, in other words the motion at the last meeting was um, to table this until the June 15th meeting. It doesn't say anything about a July. It's a, I suppose a technicality. Um, I guess it's just a case of consensus or, or uh, uh, willingness of the board to to reschedule that, that sure. doesn't require a vote. Any objection to that? We'll simply move that to July. Next piece of correspondence: uh, subdivision workshop notice um, to be held at the uh, Greater Portland Council of Governments a conference room. I believe it's the United Way room. I, I plan to go. This looks like a pretty good agenda for this Friday afternoon. Uh, if you plan to go, please call ahead. Um, next piece is the zoning ordinance amendment in reference to signs. And if you notice a three-hole punch, you should, you should insert that into your zoning uh, ordinance before you lose it. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Judy? Um, I don't understand why this section is highlighted. Is that what has been changed? Maureen? Yes, I just highlighted it to make it clear what had been changed. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. For the record, under section 19-3-3, 14 under home occupations letter E um, states there will be no signs and the change is to read except as specifically allowed in the sign ordinance as determined by the zoning board. And before I throw it away, I'm going to put it somewhere. There. The uh, next piece of correspondence is um, a, de a department order. Uh, from the uh, Department of Environmental Protection, referencing the highlands at uh, Broad Cove. Should put that in your highlands package. Um, letter from the town attorney, uh, signed by Michael Hill, um, in reference to the Wild Rose subdivision. You may want to put that with your packet. Additional, <coughs> excuse me, my voice is still changing. Um, additional correspondence uh, on the podium this evening from. Uh, to Paul Frisco from Michael McGovern in reference to 
uh, the Highlands. If you have a chance to read it, fine. Um, board members should remember that the, these are not actual submissions. Uh, they, they qualify as correspondence. Uh, it makes it difficult to re fully review any of that inf this information if it's uh, put here just as we come in. Um, the next piece is a Wild Rose Subdivision Performance Guarantee from Pinkham and Greer to Mike McGovern, uh, signed by Thomas Greer. Um, next to last item is a letter from, uh, it's a photocopy of a fairly lengthy letter, and my, my copy's cut off at the bottom, you know who that is? Told us Hilda Dudley, in reference to um, Wild Rose subdivision. And lastly, uh, evidently a part of a submission, uh, the Young uh, article on the, on the agenda. It is, uh, I believe, two HHE 200s for the two lots in that submission. Are there any other pieces of correspondence to be submitted? Okay. I will just mention uh, some people follow strict rules of etiquette and uh, allow the host only to uh, say that you can remove your jacket if you wish, but all people who have jackets on tonight, if you want to take them off, feel free to at any time. Um, I plan to in a short while. Short while. The first item of old business this evening is Highland Subdivision Amendments request by Peter Kennedy of the Greater Portland Development Group for amendments to the previously approved Highlands of 20 lot subdivision located in the area of Two Lights Road, Winding Way, Hunts Point Road, Channel View Road, Subdivision Ordinance 16-2-5. We have a, a representative of the applicant. Please come to the podium and identify yourself. Um, at this point, because we have been um, through the issues involved numerous times, I'd ask that uh, it looks like Mr. Frinsco um, to just very, very briefly go over the points of uh, uh, the items for this evening. Excuse Mr. Chairman, me, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Board. Um, as in the past, I have to excuse myself from this particular item and also the next item on the agenda as well. Okay. Um, in the past, Mr. Parker has, has uh, discussed the, the reason, explained the reason, uh, and I understand there's no objection to that. Any other uh, participants? I, can I need to step down as well. Okay. Um, I will appoint uh, Peter Cotter as a voting member this evening. So we do have four voting members uh, on this item. Mr. Frinsco. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Board, Paul Frinsco on behalf of the applicant. If I should follow the script, uh, let me briefly review with the board the additional matters which have been dealt with since the May 18th, 1993 meeting of the Planning Board. At first, you should have uh, a detailed schedule from Ross Cutlets regarding the wetlands inspection. Second, that you should have a copy of the contract between Mr. Cutlets and the Cumberland County Soil and Water Conservation District for the inspection. You should have received a copy of the recording plat uh, referencing the revisions by notes and in the signature block referencing the revisions by number. Uh, more particularly, you'll note that the note on the plan now references that this plan is a revision to the prior approved plan, which was suggested by the board at the last meeting. The uh, board should now have, and I know the town attorney has, the <coughs> survey descriptions for the roads and the drainage, the numerous drainage easements uh, together with a copy of a proposed deed. Uh, and you have been given a copy of a typical wetlands planning group. I noticed from your correspondence you have received a clean copy of the site location order from the Department of Environmental Protection. And if I might uh, reference two additional details, uh, you referenced Mr. McGovern's letter in your correspondence. Uh, as you'll note in that letter, Mr. McGovern asked me to respond directly to Mr. Hill. Uh, when I completed my trial, I did so 
and advised Mr. Hill of the following, and I believe he concurs, but I'll leave it to uh, Maureen, who he was supposed to contact later this afternoon. Uh, first, we have in place uh, a performance guarantee for the Highlands in a form approved by the Planning Board, the Town Manager, and the Town Attorney. That uh, letter of credit, which is the form of the performance guarantee, uh, is scheduled to go before the Loan Committee of First Federal Savings Loan Association tomorrow. I spoke with Mr. Donovan, who was the president of First Federal last week, and reviewed with him uh, the status of this application, and he will contact us uh, immediately tomorrow when the Loan Committee approves a substitute letter of credit, which will be a replacement letter of credit. It is our belief, and we're waiting for the approval of the town manager, that the work done to date is significantly in excess of the additional work needed to be uh, completed with respect to the wetlands restoration. Accordingly, we believe the amount of the performance guarantee will be adequate in its current amount of a 193, 715, and 20 cents. Uh, that will have to be in place uh, by July 21, 1992, in keeping with the bank's, tr uh, uh, most, most all lending institutions, uh, traditional approach to issuing letters of credit on an annual basis. Uh, with regard to the deeds for the roads, Mr. Hill and I have reached agreement on the text and the form of the deed or deeds, depending on how the town wishes to uh, acquire the property, when the town might be ready to accept. Uh, the memo from the town planner uh, suggests that the developer should deliver executed deeds to the town. Uh, I don't believe the town wants to do that uh, for a number of reasons, not the least of which upon acceptance of the deed, the town takes over the facilities. I think what the town may want is assurances that the uh, instruments of transfer will be executed and available at the time the town council wishes, wishes to accept them. Uh, Mr. Hill and I have agreed, if acceptable to the town manager, uh, that those deeds can be executed and I can hold them and notify Mr. Hill of the availability of the deeds to satisfy any conditions that the board may wish to impose with respect to executed documents. Uh, Mr. Hill was supposed to have contacted the town planner between our conversation uh, and this evening's meeting to clarify that particular point. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, uh, if the board has questions, if I can be of assistance or uh, Mr. Swan is here along with Mr. Kennedy for questions, uh, if there are any matters that need to be addressed, please let us know. We'll do our best to respond. Thank you, Mr. Prinsko. Um, I guess I would just ask Maureen um, if you ha did have a chance to talk to the town attorney uh, in reference to the executed documents. Uh, yes, I did speak with the town attorney uh, this afternoon, and he uh, agreed that while we we do want to receive deeds in a form and accept form and manner that are acceptable to the, the town manager and the town town manager and the town attorney, that um, they would be executed. Uh, as per the proposed condition, but would be held by Mr. Frisco, and Mr. Frisco would act as an escrow agent, uh, so that the town would get copies of the ex of, of the executed deeds, and then would be able to um, request those deeds once they were in a position to accept the roads. I believe that the the proposed condition you have before you is um, flexible enough, so it encompasses exactly that kind of procedure. Uh, in terms of the performance guarantee, I'm not aware the last conversation I had with the town manager, uh, there was still discussion about the need to increase the performance guarantee by a specified amount to cover the wetlands restoration. Again, I, I think the, the proposed condition before you was flexible enough to address that concern. Thank you. Any questions uh, from the board for either the planner uh, or the applicant? Any questions at all? Comments? Actually, 
Judy? Um, Mr. Chairman, I would like to clarify with um, Maureen one more time. We've had a lot of comments about um, the lack of a specific list of wetland plants that are going to be planted, their quantities and location. I feel comfortable with um, leaving it flexible given the nature of the planting, but I want to make sure that that is, staff does concur on that. Uh, I, I'm comfortable enough with leaving it flexible. In, in addition, Steve Moore faxed to me this afternoon a specific list of uh, plantings for Area 1, Area 2, and Area 3. Area 1, he's suggesting 12 winterberry, 30 pussy willows, and reed canary get grass. Area 2, 6 winterberries, 4 arrowhead viburnum, 12 pussy willows, and wool grass. And in Area 3, 18 pussy willow, 4 arrowwood viburnum, and wool grass. All of this um, is estimated for the cost of the plantings and restoration at 1460. And that has today's date. Um, it has March 30, 1993. He, he's, he's, he says he submitted it, and we've missed it in the past. I, I don't remember seeing it before, but I frankly did not go through the files to double check. Yep, that's okay. okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Do I hear a motion from the board? Mr. Chair. Judy? I'd like to propose the following motion for the board to consider, and I'll mention the board right now. I'm going to um, amend the proposed motion that we have to include some language that was in the DEP order. Findings of fact. One, Peter Kennedy of the Greater Portland Development Group is requesting amendments to Phase 1A and 1B of the Highland Subdivision, which require approval by the Planning Board in accordance with Section 16-2-5 of the Subdivision Ordinance. Two, the applicant proposes to realign and redesign the emergency access road to locate a second subsurface wastewater disposal site on Lot 4, whose use will be dependent upon where the house is located on the lot to locate a second locking gate site whose use will be dependent upon where the house is built on lot four, to redesign the landscaping at the entrance of Jordan Farm Road at Two Lights Road, to use the emergency access road for construction traffic, and to restore the wetlands whose disturbance was not part of the original project approval. Three, a public hearing on the proposed amendments was held April 20th, 1993, as provided for in section 16-2-5. Four, executed deeds are needed to assure maintenance of the stormwater plan for the subdivision in accordance with section 16-3-1I and compliance with the street design approved in section 16-3-1B. Five, the applicant has submitted a wetlands restoration plan dated January 20th, 1993 and supplemental information dated March 30th, 1993, which needs to be implemented at once to take advantage of the longest growing season possible. Six, effective implementation and monitoring of the wetlands restoration plan by qualified professionals is necessary for compliance with section 16-3-1 C, O, and D, U. Seven, performance guarantee is necessary to assure compliance with the approved subdivision plan and in accordance with section 16-2-4C7A. Eight, the proposed amendments to the Highland subdivision phases 1A and 1B substantially comply with the subdivision ordinance. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Peter Kennedy of the Greater Portland Development Group for amendments to Phase 1A and 1B of the Highland Subdivision, located in the vicinity of Two Lights Road, Winding Way, Hunts Point Road, and Channel View Road be approved, subject to the following conditions. One, that the wetlands restoration plan referenced in Finding 5 shall be implemented at once. Two, that the applicant sign the proposed contract with the Soil and Water Conservation District. Written status reports shall be filed with a code enforcement officer following each inspection. Three, that a performance guarantee be posted for the cost of wetland restoration and monitoring of Phase 1B in a form and amount acceptable to the town attorney and town manager. Four, that all drainage easement and right-of-way deeds be submitted in a form acceptable to the town manager and town attorney and executed prior to any construction, excuse me, construction or site work on the subdivision. And five, that all of the above conditions be met prior to any work or use of the site. 
It has been uh, moved. Do I hear a second? It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? And I'd ask uh, the, the Judy what, if there's any change to that after discussion um, or without any change, if you could uh, hand that. I know you hand wrote that um, with the changes to Maureen. Uh, the differences between our copy of a proposed motion are, are significantly different. Any questions uh, or comments or discussion? Seeing and hearing none, um, all those in favor of the motion as read, please raise your right hand. Those opposed, it's a unanimous vote. Thank Congratulations. You. Thank you very much. And uh, good luck. The next item, article of business, uh, new business, and we're right on schedule, is the Wild Rose subdivision request by the Ragosa Corporation for a minor subdivision review, a wetlands alteration permit, and public access waiver for the Wild Rose Path subdivision, a five lot subdivision located in the vicinity of Ocean House Road in Spur Oak Avenue, section 16-2-3, section 19-3-9, section 19-4-2B. Um, as I have in the past, because I have a conflict of interest with uh, Rick Weinschenk, who is uh, uh, not an owner or op applicant uh, as such, but an integral part of the, the application, uh, I have to step down from the podium. Uh, our vice chair is not here this evening. Uh, I will uh, ask that a very able Judith Lardner uh, take the chair. We uh, think we, we do have all four voters. Okay. Before we do anything, I would like to appoint our two associate members, Peter Cotter and Bob Marvin, to vote on this matter tonight. Um, if you could go ahead and give us a brief um, summarization of the changes made since the last meeting. Thank you very much. My name is Tom Greer from Pinkerman Greer. I'm the civil engineer for the project. Um, since the last meeting, we've made a couple changes in the plans, um, which we've highlighted here. Um, we have changed the um, landscaping along the church side of the project to I think come in line with what was uh, described to us by the planning board members. We've relocated the fences to make a, an angled section over here in the corner of the lots which would again um, be both parallel to the, the church property line as well as represent a perpendicular um, view obstruction when you're looking from Route 77 therefore providing more of a screen along this, this boundary line, um, screening what will be the back of the houses on uh, lots one and three. Um, we have also added some screening along the um, section of the road that comes very close to the boundary line. What that's going to be is an arborvitae hedge. In front of the hedge will be a, uh, the small picket fence with some roses with the um, arborvitaes coming up in behind them. Um, I think as you drive down Wild Rose Path, that will be the prominent view that you see, and, and I, think that's, I think that's what the board had in mind to replace the vegetation. Um, this section has very light vegetation now, and I think uh, with the road construction, certainly that it's in jeopardy at that point, and this replaces it. The other item that we've addressed is we have submitted to the town manager um, a construction cost estimate and a proposal for bonding the road through the construction contractor. This is similar to construction contracts that the town would use to go out for projects in this nature. Essentially, if it's, if it's looked at as a municipal project, you would have a contractor supplying a bond for the performance of the work, and that's what we'll be supplying here, which I think brings the, the project up to date. Okay, thank you. Um, Maureen, would you like to add anything to that right now? Um, 
I do have some comments from Tom Emery, who's, who's not going to be here this evening, but he had called and forwarded some of his concerns, and it seems as good a time as any to, to go over those. Um, his first concern was regarding the Abravite buffer that's proposed uh, south of the road. Uh, he's recommending that it would be a staggered double row and that the minimum size of the plantings be five feet. Uh, secondly, he's requesting that there be street tree plantings uh, along the road at a rate of one street tree per lot uh, with a minimum size of the street tree of two and a half to three inch caliber. Uh, third, he's concerned with the, the siting of the fencing in the rear of the lots um, that are on the northerly portion of the site. Uh, he's suggesting that the fencing could be located after the homes are built. Um, to give some flexibility in, in terms of how they look. He's also concerned that the distance between fence posts when you erect the fences be no greater than eight feet. That's uh, about as much as I have right now. Okay, um, I'll open this to board discussion. Any comments on that side? Any? Um, I'm unhappy that Tom Emery is not here tonight, one, because he always has very good insights into something like this, and second, because I have considerable concerns with the project still, so I'd like to indicate to the applicant and to the other board members that the lengthy comments that I have right now, I want to be heard as only as a board member and not with any authority I might have tonight sitting in this chair. Um, my still my biggest concern with this project is the conflict with the adjacent use um, I've said it before I won't go into all of that I, I recognize that this lot is in a residential zone that residential uses are permitted here I'm still though very concerned about the um, the extent of the development proposed configuration of the lots and the configuration of the road and the um, town's comprehensive plan it specifically references the desire on the town's part to preserve farm uses in the town um, it even recommends I can't remember what their language was let's see in one of their recommended implementation steps that the town ordinances should be revised to require new development to provide a buffer strip between active farmland and new residential developments in order to protect future residents and to minimize the farmers risk of complaints and nuisance suits from abutting landowners now I recognize that no such ordinances have been passed to date, but I think um, it's incumbent upon the board to really be aware of this use. And I am very concerned with how close um, a couple of lots are, and the road in particular, are to this use. Um, I still feel there's inadequate buffering between the farm, between the church, possibly between lots, is it one and three, but I'm not sure yet, I don't know there's some existing growth that might serve as a buffer there. Um, sections of the subdivision ordinance do give the board specific um, authority to look at landscaping between lots to, um, to pr provide an adequate buffer to reduce noise and lights. And there's other language that talks about um, the planning board may consider the impact of other design features such as building bulk, architectural style, and landscaping to ensure visual harmony between views to and from the proposed development and the surrounding neighborhood. Um, I don't know what you can do exactly to do, to do more with the buffering with the configuration you've proposed. Um, I, you've made an effort. I, I recognize that. Um, I'm concerned about the parking lot there. I understand there's a lot of evening activities at the Mormon Church. I don't know with the slope if lights, um, headlights will be a problem, but I, I don't feel that the proposed row of evergreens may be adequate there. I also do think that there is some existing vegetation to be preserved. You've got a note, I think, on a eight and a half by 11. Yes, we've also had a note here that this existing vegetation along the front, and uh, there's also, I think, a general note on the on the drawings that that trees in the setback zones will be preserved. Well, I know there was a general one that allowed in the um, 
outside the building envelope to be selective cutting. I, I think there have been some problems in the past, like at Elizabeth Farms with a general note like that. Uh, there was some misunderstandings about what could be cut and what couldn't. Uh, I think that if there is notable uh, vegetation, there are, I don't know if those are cherries up near the front, in that north corner, in, there's a... In this section? Yes. Yeah, we plan on leaving all of the trees there. Um, there is uh, one small gap about where we've located the sewer extension yeah. that we'll be going through, but all of the vegetation in that corner is to be left alone. Okay, I uh, think it needs to be clearly delineated, no questions what existing vegetation will be preserved. There's also, I think, an oak, a very sizable oak back by the manure pile mm -hmm. that I don't know if it's on your property. But it's, a, it's a line tree. A it's line on tree. Both. And again, we do, do plan on preserving that. I think you can see that it is located, uh, I think they located the trunk of it here, mm -hmm. and it's back outside of the construction limit, so that will be preserved. Okay. Well, as one board member, I think that's important. Um, I have not had a chance to really review the performance guarantee proposal you've put forward, but I I still would like staff to review um, the proposed landscaping, make sure that the size, the quantity, the types of plants, the planting details, cost, and especially who is responsible clarified before um, a final vote is taken on this. I still favor that the applicant be responsible for all landscaping shown on there. If this is supposed to be an affordable housing neighborhood, I don't know that it's fair to hit homeowners with that, especially when a developer can have some economies of scale when installing these things. Is the current proposal still that the homeowners uh, install it? The current proposal is all of the landscaping you see here highlighted will be put in by the developer, which is what we consider to be the, the buffering, the, the landscaping at the front entrance, the fences along the side and all the trees along the side, as well as the the, uh, the hedge along the side of the road. So you are still proposing to exclude the, the landscaping along the Wild the Rose Path? Fences, yes. Our problem with that is is that, uh, again, not wanting to duplicate some footsteps in the past that have led to problems, um, the fences really need to be located and um, built after the homes are constructed so that you have the opportunity to construct the homes and locate the fencing in the appropriate place for driveways and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. As this is a subdivision, um, we have a proposed developer who look, looks to build the homes but may not necessarily be tied into that, to that project. We need some flexibility here to allow the homeowner to put the fences where they belong and therefore that's why we feel that they really ought to go along with, with the, the homeowner's purchase price of the home. Um, we feel that the language on it requires the homeowner to do that and to install a certain amount of fencing along the road to meet the design concept, but really tying it to the bonding of the developer in the initial phase as part of the road construction we feel is, is really not appropriate. Um, we do agree with the board that, that we will put in the fencing and buffering around the outside edge, which again can be put in up front without impacting really the home design. Um, Tom Emery's le letter um, again puts that a little bit in doubt, his comments, making these, these two here somewhat flexible where he would like to see them. Um, I don't think there is a lot of flexibility where those are going. Um, you need to create a backyard on the homes and um, you also need to keep them uh, um, in, in the view corridor from, from Route 77. So I, I think you're only talking a couple of feet and I don't think it's really going to make a whole lot of difference one way or the other. Mr. Greer, it appeared from some of the plans I looked at that the fence in the Rosa Ragosa is actually located within the 30-foot right-of-way. Is that a drafting error? Uh, yes, it's really intended to be right at the, at the uh, edge of that, so that it's actually, there's a five-foot shoulder there that would be used for snow banks and, and that type of thing, so it'd be just off the, the uh, right-of-way. Okay, because I think even on the detailed plans, it's shown within the right-of-way. Um, <coughs> I would like some discussion if there is any comments from the planning board on the um, name of the street. It's been raised several times by the town planner. It's my understanding that public safety does not have concerns about the similarity in street names. Uh, I spoke with the fire chief and he spoke with his deputies and, and they don't have any concerns about the name at this time. Do other board members have any concerns? I understand from Maureen that there has been a lot of confusion on the part of the public what project this is. I, I would tend to go with public works if they think they can get there in an emergency, then that's okay with me, but 
Does anyone have a strong feeling about that? I think I'll address this to you, Maureen. Um, town engineers had lengthy comments in every memo except this one where he has no comments. Is that because his concerns have been addressed or has he just laid out his previous concerns and had nothing my, new? My assumption is that that's due to the, the uh, expert advice and revisions by the applicant's engineer and getting all the previous comments that town engineer has um, addressed Typically, our town engineer, if, if something's not addressed, he refers to a previous letter and says, you haven't done this yet. So um, the letter is unusual in that it's very short, and it appears that technically these plans are complete. Um, are you aware of the fire chief approving the turnaround configuration, which waivers were requested for? Uh, the fire chief has, has seen all of these, and I, he has not told me he has any problem with them. Um, there was a concern about monumentation at property corners. I don't know what's been done differently on these plans. I believe there was a request by the applicant for some waiver or some property monumentation. And yes. I know that the waivers are something that are, are granted by the board. So I think uh, the town engineer had requested that, that the standard monumentation be placed. And um, it, that's up to the board now whether you want to approve the plans as proposed or whether you would like that standard monumentation. Mr. Greer, can you outline what waivers you're asking for there? Yes. Um, along, along this boundary line, there are many little small jogs in the line. It follows the stone wall, and the stone wall's not straight, so it's comprised of, of cords along this section. What we're looking to do is put the standard monumentation in at the normal property pins where you, where you would see them, but not along the stone wall in this section and through here. So that you would you would get them, you would get them at at, at this corner, um, at the right of way entrance here, um, at the curve in the road, um, at the lot lines in the corners of each one of these lots, but just not along this this edge. This is a lot of pins to put in, and and really I think is is more of a destruction to the wall and that type of thing. Trying to get them set, so that's what we're looking for. And that is your understanding of what he was looking for. Um, Additional monumentation in that area. My understanding was is that we were not going to set all of the pins, and the way he interpreted it was you'd set pins at all of the property corners. Technically, these become property corners because there's a bend in the, in the line. And pins, instead of um, the larger monumentation, is typical and acceptable on the separate lot boundaries? Yes. There's a, usually a, uh, uh, an iron rod with a, well, most of them are a yellow cap on them that has the surveyor's name and number and that type of thing. Okay. Um, quite a while ago, the town engineer did raise the issue of a traffic impact study, which I don't think we've ever discussed. Um, am I wrong, Maureen? Has that been discussed, I, given the um, proximity to Spurwink Avenue and the problems we've had there? Um, and I, I guess I'm going to let Tom go over this as well. But as I remember, there was an evaluation of, of where Wild Rose Path would intersect with Route 77, and it's more than 125 feet from the intersection with, with uh, Spurwink and Route 77. And there also is adequate sight distance at that point. So my understanding, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that, that you would pass both those, uh, those tests yes. of minimum standard. Okay, thank you. Um, another issue that has been raised in past memos, and again, I'm not sure if we've had a final answer on, is that the subdivision ordinance recommends a 10-foot wide pedestrian easement, whereas a 5-foot one is proposed. Can you explain the discrepancy? Um, we felt that a 5-foot um, going around this edge here, we're talking at this side of the boundary right in here, would be adequate. Um, what that does is it, it keeps people um, off the septic system, and we would really like them to be along the, the boundary line as much as possible. Um, across the back, um, we've granted uh, pedestrian easement for this this whole strip across mm -hmm. here with the idea that a path could wind through it. So again, in, in the developed area, we would really like to keep it to a minimum and keep the keep it on a very close path so that uh, there's minimal impact to the to lot five. Maureen, we've had written comments from the Conservation Commission, but were they concerned to your knowledge with that width? Uh, I, I believe I raised that with because it, right now it's a standard in the subdivision ordinance. I don't believe that the, the Conservation Commission raised that issue. They were more concerned with 
how you got to the easement since the road was proposed to be private. Uh, since that time, there's been a, a, an agreement that the, the, the right-of-way, the private right-of-way uh, deed would be revised to allow the public to cross over the road mm -hmm. um, in order to get to this easement. Uh, I would like to point out that, that I know that there have been some requests by the town attorneys for some revisions to the existing deeds, and those have not been submitted. Uh, but I believe they're they're pretty specific the kind of changes that are needed and I believe that that they could be covered by the proposed condition of approval and, and we're more than willing to, to go along with those conditions okay um, also with respect to that green belt the Conservation Commission has ex um, requested that the developer install the signage is that something that you agree to the applicant will agree to in terms of for the for the green belt here? Yes. Um, when there is a connection, I'm sure they'd be happy to do that. Um, the problem we see here is, and it was brought up by um, the abutter, um, this piece of the path really goes nowhere. Mm -hmm. And um, at this point, we would rather not advertise a short piece of the path that, that really doesn't get you any place. What it will create is hard feelings between us and the neighbors. So uh, I guess we would rather have it signed down the road when it goes someplace than at this particular time. Okay. Um, a final issue, and I don't think it's something would be fair to hold this developer up, but I think the board needs to seriously consider this whole issue of private roads versus public roads in subdivisions. I know there's a history of private roads in this town. There's a history of approving private roads in subdivisions on this board in very recent past as well. Um, I'm starting to become very uncomfortable with this approach. Um, it's my understanding that both in fairly new subdivisions as well as very old established private roads, neighbors are um, petitioning the town or requesting that the town accept these roads. Um, I understand their requests. They pay taxes like the rest of us, and yet they don't have similar town services on those roads. And yet the, the town has been hesitant to accept various roads for different reasons, substandard right-of-way, perhaps substandard construction, um, utilities that are private that are in the public or the proposed public roadway. I think uh, if anyone has any comments on this project, I'd like to hear them now. But I would also just like to raise this as a general subject of com conversation that perhaps in a workshop we should look at this because I think it puts the town in an awkward position and it puts the residents possibly in an unfair position. Um, after saying all that, does anyone have any comments yet on the board? I have a comment which I'd like to address to Maureen. Uh, one of the letters that we received in our packet this month was uh, from Mr. Greenleaf in which the proposed language in the deeds to the grant grantees would read that uh, by acceptance of the deed, the grantee would acknowledge that the subdivision abuts an operating horse stable with all the sights, sounds, and smells associated with a horse stable. Uh, has there been any um, or indication or do you know of any uh, uh, or has town attorney indicated that this that this is a, a mechanism which uh, sort of uh, by its presence in the deed uh, serves the purpose of, a, of actually uh, ac encouraging the active uh, use of the horse farm? Uh, the town attorney and I have had lengthy discussions on this issue. Uh, what I have recommended to the board this evening is that uh, this, the actual language be included as a note on the plan because typically the, the board or myself do not review individual lot deeds. So just to make sure at least that language um, has to be in a deed, the easiest way to do that is to put it on the recording plan. Uh, secondly, in terms of what <coughs> purpose that is supposed to serve, um, my feeling is that by putting that kind of language in a lot deed, it puts the lot owners on notice that there is a, a working farm next door and that there may be um, influences from that farm that they would not always find pleasing. Uh, what it does not do 
is uh, protect the farm from future lot owners complaining about those influences. Um, while they may be unnoticed that the sights and sounds of a farm may, may be next door, that doesn't mean they cannot complain about those. Uh, I've spoken with the town attorney to look at uh, some mechanisms that we may be able to try to uh, somewhat limit the ability of future lot owners to uh, criticize the farm as long as it was operating in a, in a reasonable manner. Uh, there does not seem to be a way to do that at this time. Uh, we discussed perhaps requiring that language be uh, put into the, the covenants for the association, um, but a majority of the association owners can uh, amend any of those subdivision covenants. So um, we're kind of at a, at a point where it looks like the only thing we can do at this time, other than using the other standards in the subdivision ordinance in terms of what Ms. Lardner uh, mentioned in terms of buffering, that uh, the only thing we can do is, is put new lot owners on notice. Any other comments? Mr. Greer, I went over a lot of things. Do you have any comments with respect to what I said? Um, I, I guess just some, some general comments. Uh, one, the, the, the layout of the plan here is, as far as we're concerned, well within the ordinance and the lot sizes, and it's certainly in the zone. Um, we're, we recognize the horse farm that's next door, and I think we want to make sure that the future lot owners recognize it. But also, we don't want to be penalized simply because it's an existing land use when we have an acceptable land use here in, in the zone. Um, we feel we've gone to a reasonable length to provide buffering, to provide um, some screening and vegetation you know, around the project and to make sure that, that it does meet the standards. Um, I have the feeling that you are looking for some um, screening that goes way beyond what I would consider to be normal residential screening. And I, I guess I would, would hope that you would consider the plan that we have as being reasonable and that it would be approved as such. Um, Tom mentions in his, his letter the additional street trees and um, doubling up on the, the, the arborvitae hedge. Um, the street trees are four street trees. That's probably not a big deal. I, I think those are, are probably okay. Um, doubling up on the arborvitae hedge, I'm not so sure that that's really in the, in the best interest um, of what our goal here is, is to produce a subdivision in Cape Elizabeth that does come closer to being affordable. Um, you're adding a lot of costs. If you look at the bond amount, um, that's a pretty significant bond amount for five homes. Um, I guess with that said, I, and we are certainly looking for a positive vote and move forward tonight. Okay, I'd like to um, one more time give my views on the buffer again as a board member and not as the acting chair. I recognize this isn't a residential zone, but you've also chosen a difficult lot because you have two non-residential uses, as it were. Um, on either side of you, both for different reasons, meriting, buffering. Um, it would probably be more straightforward to you if you were budding a business owner, so forth, and you could look at the ordinance and it would specifically state the type of def um, buffering required between not only uses but zones. Um, I feel very strongly about this as one board member. I think it is difficult. I also. Um, let me step back again. I, I can see this as being a nice project when I look at the homes that Mr. Weinshank has designed, especially the recently ones, recently done ones right over the border in South Portland. Um, but we have no guarantee we're going to see homes like that in the, uh, I can't remember if it's in the proposed covenants or just in various correspondence. It indicates that these homes will be built by the lot owners whereas Mr. Weinshek has um, expressed his desire to be the one who's designing these homes. We don't know that, so I have no idea what kind of homes will go in there. And I was on the side again today, once, especially the trees come down near that very narrow spot between your property, or between the road and the um, manure pile basically come down, I think that is going to be a horrendous sight, not only for the people in that subdivision, but for anyone driving down Route 77. Um, 
and I'm, I, from the beginning, I've been concerned with this whole notion of coming to the nuisance, even though there's laws to prevent um, newcomers to areas to closing down so-called nuisances, those that, that doctrine often does not apply and hold up in the courts. And I feel uncomfortable with that. Given all this, um, it's, it's appropriate to ask for a motion at this point. Um, in fairness to both the applicant, to the other board members, and Mr. Emery, you might also consider, besides the motion set before you, um, a tabling motion if you would like to hear either more comments from Mr. Emery or give the applicant a chance to make any um, additional um, revisions to his plans. But I'm certainly open to any motion that you would like to make. I can't do this. Madam Chair, I'd like to propose the following motion for the board to consider. Uh, finding of fact, one, Rick Weinshank and Peter Greenleaf of Rose the Rosa Ragosa Corporation are requesting minor subdivision review, a wetlands alteration permit, and public access waivers for Wild Rose, a five lot subdivision located in the vicinity of Route 77 and Spurwink Ave which requires review under section 16-2-3, 19-3-9, and 19-4-2B. Two, the application was deemed complete in April 1993, and a public hearing was held in May 1993. Three, adequate plant sizes are needed to provide a substantial and resilient buffer in accordance with section 16-3-1C. Four, that an enforceable blasting plan is, a, is appropriate to protect the general health, safety, and welfare in the area. Five, compatibility of the proposed subdivision with existing adjacent uses should be encouraged to promote the goals of the comprehensive plan and to avoid possible land use conflicts. Six, a performance guarantee is necessary to assure that the subdivision is constructed according to the approved plan and in compliance with section 16-2-4C7A. Seven, the deeds proposed by the applicant need to be executed in order to comply with section 16-3-1I, J, and O. Eight, the plans and materials submitted substantially comply with the standards of 16-2-3, 19-3-9, and 19-4-2B. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Wick Reinschenk and Peter Greenleaf of the Ragosa Corporation for minor subdivision approval, a wetlands alteration permit, and public access waivers for Wild Rose, a five lot subdivision located in the vicinity of Route 77 and Spurwink Ave be approved subject to the following conditions. One, that the minimum size of the pyramidal arborvitae be increased to four feet to five feet in height and number of plantings increased to a staggered double row or the equivalent quantity thereof in configuration to be approved by planning staff. Two, that one street tree be added per lot. Three, that the fence design for each lot be reviewed prior to construction by the town planner. Four, that the reference to the town engineer in the blasting plan be changed to the fire chief. Five, that a note is to be added to the plan that all lot deeds shall contain language noting that a horse farm is located next to the subdivision. Five, that a performance guarantee be submitted in a form and amount acceptable to the town attorney and town manager. The performance guarantee shall include the cost of all plantings and all fencing on the subdivision plan. Five, that executed drainage and public access deeds be submitted in a form acceptable to the town attorney and town manager. 
six, that all of the above conditions be met and the plans be revised within 90 days of this approval. Do I hear a second? Second. Maureen, do you think you have that motion as amended or would you like that to be reread? <coughs> would you then read for myself and for the board um, the conditions and you can skip over the ones that are um, exactly as proposed here? Starting with condition one, uh, it is unchanged until you get to the four to five feet in height and the number of plantings increased to a double staggered row or equiv equivalent uh, reviewed by the planning staff. Uh, number two is the requirement that one street tree per lot be planted. Uh, number three is that um, the fencing for each lot be, I guess it's location of fencing. Uh, for each lot be reviewed prior to construction by the town planner. Uh, four is what was originally number two. Uh, five is what was originally number three. And then I'm going to take a little um, license in terms of numbering. I think <laughs> four is number six. Five is number seven. Uh, and number six, uh, the last line, it should say all fencing on the subdivision plan. And on the, the last one, number six should be number eight. Does that sound correct? Do I hear any discussion on this proposed motion? Okay, I will again step down from being chair and um, I guess do a little lobbying. First, even though I'm not able to vote for this motion, I would like to suggest perhaps a couple or maybe only one amendment to that. On number two, you requested that one street tree be added to lot. Would you like to indicate like a two and a half inch to three inch caliper as suggested by Mr. Emery? Yes. Um, is that okay on the second? Mr. Mormon, did you second Yes. It? Let me see if there are any other things that might be appropriate. Can I clarify one of the additions? Please. On the staggered double row, the reason why I said in configuration uh, reviewed by town planner was I think that the concept of that buffer as a backdrop as one uh, proceeds in and out of the subdivision is, is an excellent one. However, um, almost all views of it are from the end view and a four foot arborvitae from the end, especially when you're at a higher elevation, looks like nothing at all uh, and I would favor something which would uh, perhaps have the configuration shown there but uh, do a little bit more around the sides especially toward route 77 we, we also yeah we stopped it at that location because that's about when you become underneath the canopy of the large oak mr. Wilcox do you want to suggest a certain number or because I, I assume I can speak for staff on this point, a very general condition like that would leave this open to a lot of interpretation. I can imagine the applicant adding to mm -hmm. and the planner perhaps thinking more were um, required or Maureen, could, do you feel this is adequate? Um, the way I interpret this right now is, is I'm going to read how many, I think it's 15 plantings right now. And I think it's yeah. 18 to 20. Right. I think we've, we've so I'm assuming you want, first of all, you want the number doubled. Mm -hmm. and you want the depth increased and then you're going to want something a little bit more tasteful yeah, on the ends flexible it doesn't have right. to be one for one double row right but it could be mm -hmm. clumped clumped toward the ends that there should be some flexibility in how it's and I, I certainly don't I mean if, if you're really interested in making sure the ends are the way you would like I wouldn't no. have any problem in calling you when the applicant submitted the plan and, and having you look no. at it to make Not some suggestions but I mean essentially what I would do is make sure the plantings were, were doubled that, that the configuration is generally what you're what you've just described mm -hmm. but you are proposing perhaps 36 to 40 arborvitae there in some pleasing configuration yes and your motion did include um, that the applicant would also be responsible for the fencing and roses along wild rose path is that intended to include those plantings because they have proposed not to install those. Mm -hmm. 
they're installed uh, as part of the homeowners. Right. I, I would like to point out that yeah. they, uh, under this motion, you're, uh, that it's under consideration, the applicant would, <coughs> excuse me, would have to bond for those. So uh, mm -hmm. one way or the other, they're going to be put in. I think my intent there was in saying that town planner would, would review the configuration would be that as they were put in place by the homeowner that okay. the configuration would be approved. Okay. Um, let me see if there's any other things appropriate to that particular motion. I don't think I would suggest anything else. Again, I, I might recommend if any board members are open to persuasion that that there are things that might still need to be addressed, but I will leave it at that. Any final comments? Then I will, um, all those in favor of the motion as read and as amended, please raise your right hand. All those opposed? The vote show three in favor, one opposed. Good luck on your project. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Judy. <coughs> I might uh, mention, um, only occasionally do I get to sit back there and I, and I just urge the board members when you talk. I don't think it was upset, I think the wind caught it, hopefully. Um, to speak up and speak into the microphone. The next order of business this evening, and we do seem to be uh, just uh, a little bit over our schedule, but uh, reasonably on time, is a Young Public Access Waiver, the request by Harold and Mary Young, for public access waiver of two lots off Sawyer Road, public access waiver section 19-4-2B, zoning ordinance. The representative, uh, the applicant could come to the mic and, and identify yourself if you give just a, a real brief uh, summary of uh, the changes made to date. Uh, Harold Young, 1119 Sawyer Road, good evening. Um, I'm here for uh, public access waiver off of Fickett Street. And the last time I was here, we were I was tabled. And one of the reasons was you preferred a 50-foot right away over a 30-foot. And I think you've seen them changes. And uh, I guess that's about it, unless you have any questions. I OK. Uh I'll review in, 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 sure, in summary, uh, if you want, some of those, um, the 50-foot right of way has been changed on the plan. Um, the, I, I think, uh, although it was not clear, I think now it's, it's clear that the first uh, 50 feet of pavement from uh, Fickett um, Street will be paved. Is yes, that correct? that's correct. Um, maximum grade at 3.5 percent, which is, is slightly more than, than ordinance, but at the site seems to be very, very acceptable um, and would prevent further cutting into the bank. Exactly. Uh, which would probably be more unsightly than, the, than any advantage from, from keeping it at 2%. Uh, turning, turning radius of 20 feet, and I think the site distance issue has been addressed in perhaps our engineer's uh, comments. We received a letter from the fire chief um, dealing with a turning radius sufficient to get a, a piece of equipment into that uh, short uh, access. Um, building envelopes have been added to the plan, although not uh, defined as what activity uh, takes place in there. I think one item that, that uh, the town engineer mentions in, in this month's letter, item number three, where he talks back to seven, uh, number seven of the May 10, um, that item deals, and I'll read from la the, the May 10 item, uh, the ordinance state that a, that a gutter drainage I'm sorry, that gutter drainage along the street shall not be allowed to sheet across the face of the intersection. The information provided is not sufficient enough to evaluate the disposition of street drainage. When we were on site at the site walk, and I think everybody was there, and I, I think it was, it was good to get a good turnout, um, we saw that uh, the construction of, of Fickett, Fickett Road, at that, yeah. Fickett Street at that, that point, um, it did not appear that it would sheet out onto the, the road, that there was a, a curb on one side and then we're actually uh, catch basins right, not too far from, below the from, the, uh, from the driveway. We also received a, a, a copy, I think everybody received a, a copy of 
one of the questions was how this piece of property relates to the entire uh, parcel of land. At this point, uh, turn open to board discussion. I will uh, appoint uh, Bob Marvin uh, as a voting member. We're missing Tom Emery uh, as a voting member this evening on this issue. Any comments, questions? Um, Steve. I think from everything I've read, um, I think everything has been satisfied, and I, for one, am ready to make a motion. Okay. Um, sure, if you feel like making a motion, go ahead. Okay. Motion for the board to consider, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Harold and Mary Young for public access waivers for the two lots to be created off of Fickett Street be approved, subject to the following condition. Number one, that the plan depicting access and the language describing right-of-way and maintenance be recorded at the Cumberland County Registry of Deeds as part of the deed for each lot. The book and page number of the plan recording shall be submitted to the town planner prior to issuance of a building permit for either lot. Second. It has been moved and seconded. Is there any other discussion? No. One change that I forgot to mention was that the, the length of the road was uh, changed to the hammer, or the turnaround is actually um, shortened as we, we saw on the sidewalk. Any other discussion? Questions? Seeing and hearing none. All those in favor of the motion as read, please raise your right hand. Those opposed, it's the unanimous vote. Thank you very Congratulations much. Congratulations and good you. luck. <clears throat> Under other business, we'll take up the emergency ordinance amendment request by the town council to recommend amendments to the wetlands regulations zoning ordinance chapter 19. This was an item that was taken up at the, the workshop um, two weeks ago. Uh, perhaps Maureen, if you can real quickly, just for the record, uh, give a history of the, the reason for this uh, um, emergency ordinance amendment and uh, where we stand. Um, earlier, uh, probably 45 days ago, the town council adopted a three-month, 90-day moratorium on construction of critical wetland buffers uh, and then immediately requested that the planning board consider revisions to the zoning ordinance, uh, specifically the non-conforming section in the wetlands regulations, uh, which regulate what structures can do if they are non-conforming as opposed to the wetland setbacks. Um, attached here is uh, a draft amendment. Uh, the drafts are based on, on the discussion the board had at the previous workshop. It certainly is uh, still subject to um, whatever revisions the board would like to uh, propose. Uh, the only thing the board may want to keep in mind is that because of the 90-day duration of the moratorium, time is of the essence. And um, there has been a suggestion that the board may want to consider scheduling a special meeting um, just to uh, hold a public hearing on this item so that it could be forwarded to the council that much sooner. Um, any amendment to the zoning ordinance has to go to the planning board. The board has to hold a public hearing. It then has to go to the council. The council has to hold a public hearing. So 90 days clearly is a very short time span to be able to, to undertake an amendment. Um, so that the board may want to consider perhaps looking at scheduling a special meeting uh, for June 29th, which is two weeks from tonight. Are there any questions? I think, uh, number one, because this is a, an article or an item on the agenda that, that there is no applicant. And um, uh, sometimes in our workshops, conversation and, and discussion drags on. I just try to keep the, the discussion as lively as po possible. And, and perhaps if we can just walk down through uh, the revisions made to date um, and go over any questions. Uh, we did it. We had a great discussion, I thought, uh, at the last workshop. We made a lot of pro progress. Um, I guess the questions and comments on the, uh, the, uh, the amendments made to date. Any questions as we walk down through there? Anything on the first page? I have a question. Sure, Judy. Um, under discussion, Maureen, you indicate you expect comments from the town attorney on this draft. Have you received those yet? 
Um, I, I have submitted a copy of this uh, to the town attorney for his review, um, and he, he's, he's reviewing it. I haven't asked him to write anything, however, until after this meeting in order okay. to just save a little bit of money and cost him more money to write a letter than to tell me. So um, he had made a couple of uh, minor changes um, just to drop down to probably the, the, the most pertinent section, 19 through 912. Uh, we had talked about whether we need to put in non residential or non-residential non-conforming structures, um, whether we could just say non-conforming structure and it would cover everything. Um, this ordinance is, uh, has some peculiar areas where it refers to non-residential or refers to residential, and we just want to check through the rest of the ordinance and make sure that we don't have to specifically say that. There are some ports places in the ordinance where it's just assumed that everything applies to residential, and, and the intent of this was to apply to any structure. Uh, so uh, for right now, I've left it in here for, for two reasons. One, we're still checking to see whether we need it, and two, uh, when you have language that's underlined, it calls your attention to it, and you realize it's, it's a little bit more clear that there's a policy change here. Um, originally, uh, the ordinance right now treats residential structures differently from non-residential structures, and at the last workshop, uh, the board um, just decided that there was no need for that differentiation. I think two of the, the key issues that are taken up in this, this one paragraph, um, and one of those being that, that we're taking, we're stripping away the difference between the non-residential use and, and, and residential use. As, as far as that's concerned, I think as long as it is, um, uh, if, it, if it brings more clarity to the ordinance and is not onerous language, um, then I, I see no reason why not to leave it in. Uh, if it if it makes it more consistent with the rest of the ordinance and ordinances um, to not bother to use it, then then fine. We'll, we'll keep the, the uniformity of, of uh, language in there. But um, that is one issue. Um, the other issue is that that prior. Um, uh, previously, the, or the existing ordinance uh, states 25 percent. Uh, we're moving that to 30 percent uh, to move it in line with the state uh, minimum, I believe. Is that correct, Maureen? Uh, the state shoreline zoning requirements, so there's a, a real parallel there. Okay. Um, the one thing that the board may want to look at, because I think you do need to at least discuss it this evening, is um, the definition of floor area. Uh, what you're what you're proposing is that um, non-conforming structures would be allowed to be expanded by 30 percent of the floor area, uh, and there needs to be a definition of floor area in the ordinance. What you have before you are two alternatives. Uh, the first one is the definition that's recommended by the state shoreland zoning. So if if you want it to be consistent in in um, taking the shoreline zoning uh, limits on non-conforming structure expansions, then you may want to go with that definition as well. Uh, one thing I would suggest, however, is because of some uh, history the town has had and how you measure floor area, you may want to just add a little something to that definition that specifically talks about how it's measured. Um, alternately, uh, you may want to go with alternative two, which is a more restrictive uh, definition of floor area. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't allow you to include as much of the structure. It excludes what you might refer to as uh, non-habitable areas, um, including porches and, and decks. Uh, what I would suggest is you may want to go with either alternative one or alternative two, but the last sentence in alternative two be included in either definition. Any comments on that? Because we do need to, to give some guidance as to, uh, and I believe, uh, you think we should pick one of these this evening before we go to public hearing? Um, actually, uh, I was thinking about that. You, you definitely need to pick one soon, uh, but you don't necessarily have to pick it tonight. You, you could uh, leave both of them in here and, and make a decision after the public hearing. I would prefer that if there's any public input. I, this could make a big difference, and I'm curious if anyone. If, if you remember, the, the, the conflict being that, that um, the issue is really um, to try to prevent uh, or try to regulate the, the increase in the amount of imperviable, uh, impervious uh, area in the existing wetlands, and um, based on whether you use the entire footprint 
uh, floor area, um, whether it includes garages, non-heated living areas, and so forth, has a lot to do with what um, your the total amount of or 30 percent of X, uh, whether you're including a small area or a larger area. Um, so, what, what's the consensus of the board as far as uh, whether we keep both of these in? Do we suggest one uh, versus the other? Are, are the portions are they? Can we change? Uh, uh, anybody see whether the, where the uh, state shoreland zoning definition should be improved or changed? Or, Mark? Yeah, Mr. Chair, I, I think that for the time being we should leave both of them in. And my feelings on the first one is, is that it is a little, um, that it is not definite enough in that it includes porches. I don't see where uh, the uh, sort of covered area of a structure in a wetland buffer which has to do with impact on the ground uh, suffers that much from from the porches and in terms of making a restrictive definition I think that we should be looking more in terms of covered space in other words including garages but not including porches especially if they're not rather not including decks because we say I think enclosed porches might cover those I think there's some fine tuning that could be done on alternative number one and alternative number two ex with a sort of vague uh, definition of excluding non-habitable area leaves open the, the possibility that uh, closets and uh, a room that's used for storage and not actually living, uh, even if only temporarily, even though a structure was designed to have living space, uh, you know, that doesn't seem quite, quite appropriate in terms of uh, a homeowner's interests. Any other comments? Yeah, it se seems to me that um, you know, given the fact that there are a lot of different people going to be reading this ordinance in the future um, in the interest of keeping it as simple as possible, um, I think alter alternative number one um, probably is going to be the easier one for everyone to understand. Uh, there won't be no, no confusion as to whether, <coughs> you know, closets or whatever um, are not included. Mm -hmm. And it's very simple that the, the footprint um, or alternative number one is what we're doing. So that would be my my um, vote. But I'm willing to leave both of them in until after the public hearing to see if there's any strong motion, you know, sentiment either way. It, it it seems like a minor issue, but there are going to be instances, most likely in the near future, um, where this is a key. Definition is you know, where do you, where's where's square one, um, and uh, I certainly agree with Stephen. Um, if we can keep it as simple as possible, without making this long list of, of or checklist of what counts, what doesn't count, and how many interior walls and sort of count and what doesn't, we're that much further ahead. Um, I just want to make sure that it is real clear um, that when we talk about the sum of the horizontal areas of the floor or floors of a structure enclosed by exterior walls plus the horizontal area of any unenclosed portions of a structure such as porches and decks um, that that's real clear um, this definition has nothing to do with the heated living area uh, what the use of that inside area really is um, it's just that simply that it is enclosed and it's a total sum Any other questions, comments? So I, I gather that this, it's a consensus that you'd like to keep uh, both of these alternatives in, perhaps opening it up for public discussion if there is any. And number two, um, that there's no change to, to, to make to these? Uh, Steve? I'm starting to feel a little differently now than after I've just spoken. Um, I think I'd almost like to just leave alternative number one in and drop alternative number two altogether. I see that leading to a long discussion about nothing and end up complicating Certainly, you know, that, that's, that's up to the wishes of the board as to what we propose. Um, but I, in this case, I'm, I am looking for a consensus uh, of what the board wishes. Uh, what the, the changes that we make this evening will go to um, the public hearing. Um, and, I'm, and I'm sure that there will be some people who will be affected by this uh, will have comment. Judy? In response to what Steve just said, um, 
I, too, favor as simple wording as possible, and for that reason I have um, real problems with alternative number two. However, I'm not sure I would favor number one because it does include decks, porches, and garages. I would either favor keeping the two as written for the public hearing or coming up with some hybrid um, between the two, perhaps have alternative number one, which is straightforward, basically all of a house is um, computed for the floor area, and perhaps an alternative number two could be a similar wording, but specifically excluding garages, porches, and decks. I, I, I can't make up my mind at this <coughs> point, and if there is any public input, that will really help me which way to go. Okay, one, one last little comment on this thing. Um, I guess the reason I'm so much in favor of alternative number one is the fact that it does include garages, porches, and decks. Um, I don't see any reason why um, they shouldn't be included, and that's, I'm not going to say any more. I'm going to ask a question of Maureen and, and brush off the question if, if, if it's um, uh, <laughs> too difficult. Do you have any idea in, the, in this town how many home sites are presently um, with, with structures, existing structures, uh, would be affected by this? Do you have any idea? I, I was wondering if you were going to ask that question this evening. And um, I was trying to recall a memo that the board received, I believe, over a year ago. Uh, from the, the code enforcement officer that was drafted, I believe, in 1990 when the original wetlands provisions were uh, under consideration. And the number 261 homes sticks in my mind as the number of homes or lots that would be affected by the critical wetland buffer. Um, and I can double check that, but it's, I, I believe it's somewhere in that range. Okay. Um, I, I was just trying to do some quick math as to how much wetlands over, you know, if, if you take 250, I, I can't do it by 260, uh, 250 and you have an average square house, uh, square footage in the house of 2,000 square feet, 30% uh, of that uh, is 600. Uh, you're talking at about uh, 5,000, I'm sorry. About 150,000 square feet in wetlands over 250 lots. Um, which is not a lot of area, which is the, the total maximum impact that, that this um, law uh, or, or this part of the ordinance could, uh, to, could affect. Um, at the same time, it's, a, it's an important uh, de definition. Any other comment, uh, Maureen? Um, uh, up until this point, you, you have talked mostly about uh, how much of an expansion. The one other thing you may want to consider, which is also addressed by these changes, is um, what direction the expansion goes in. And um, I did attach um, a, a discussion that was prepared by the DEP on how um, you addressed expansion of structures towards the shoreland. And I think um, it's very uh, adaptable to the current discussion. I spoke with the code enforcement officer this afternoon, and his interpretation is, if you want to refer to the, uh, the, the numbered, the letter drawings, is that um, under the current shoreland zoning, his interpretation is that uh, the expansions that are depicted under A and B would not be allowed, but the expansions proposed under C and D would be allowed. The other thing he pointed out is, if you look at the expansion under drawing B, and you take the area that was going to be expanded, <coughs> excuse me, and placed it on the right-hand side of the structure, it would then be permitted. I, I, I guess I'm not following, because I'm looking at the answer to, the, according to the DEP, expansions of, of B, C, and D would be permitted, while those of A would be prohibited? Right. Under, under the DEP, um, their interpretation. Okay. But, um, towns can be uh, as restrictive as they choose to. Uh, the DEP standard says that everything except A would be permitted. Under our current ordinance, we allow um, the type of expansions that are depicted in drawing C and D. Uh, so we're a little bit more restrictive than the state. Uh, the, the question the code enforcement officer raised, and I think it's an interesting one, is that um, under B, if you were to take that exact same amount of area, and put it on the side of the building, on the right side, 
-hmm. it would then become an allowable expansion. And I, I, you, you might want to question whether that really makes a lot of sense. He didn't. He didn't really. Think I think it made that's a lot exactly why the DEP says th right. that that is an acceptable right. uh, um, expansion. You know, if if the board has some some feelings about what kind of expansions they find acceptable, uh, I can work on making sure the language reflects what what you would like to see. I, I would hate to to have to to. Um, sit and try to explain why this board would interpret um, B as not being acceptable and uh, C being acceptable to, to an applicant uh, in real life. Uh, I, I would, I, I, as one board member, I would uh, ask you to, to try to um, follow the DEP interpretation. Any other comment on that? Any consensus there as to the interpretation? It sounds good what you just said. Okay. I had, see heads nodding. For those people listening, it's too confusing to even to try to explain what we're talking about. We do have pictures that we're looking at, and uh, it seems uh, to be minutiae unless you have to, to regulate it. So. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? It's a good point, though. It's something we need to, to uh, have a clear understanding of. Mr. Chair. Something that intrigued me in here was on page three of these, um, I guess the DEP guidelines. On the left-hand column going down about two-thirds of the way, they start talking about Freeport zoning ordinance. Um, I found that intriguing because they talk about allowing for a limited one-time non-conforming expansion to take place. And somewhere in here, they, I guess it was the state commenting on Freeport's, Freeport's ordinance indicated that that made sense because of the ease of administration that once you figured out what a 30 percent addition would be it would happen and i guess mainly from the code enforcement officer's standpoint it might be easier to monitor um i'd be curious if anyone has thought about that or would want to think about that before the next meeting and if that's something we would favor just the only thing that really caught my eye mark uh, I, ha I noticed that myself, and while I agree that it would make it simpler for the code enforcement officer, I think that as, uh, in terms of property owner's rights, if we're going to say 30% is okay, that if you want to do 15% one year and do another 10% five years down the road, that your impact on the wetland is probably, you know, it's not going to be any greater and that that should be allowable. Uh, and in terms of making things more difficult for the code enforcement officer, if, if anything, the, um, the diagrams in my mind raise the possibility that one might be more restrictive for an addition that's on the side of the house or within the L-shaped on the front of the house and be less restrictive in terms of total percentage on something that was on the rear of the house. We do have houses in which, uh, unlike this diagram, the back of the house is also within the wetlands buffer and you might be. I don't know whether it would just be too utterly confusing to have, say, 20% on the front and 35% on the back or, or something like something like that. Um, I, I mm -hmm. did discuss that with the code enforcement officer, and we talked about, I mean, you know, basically it's, it's wide open. I mean, this is a policy discussion. You can do what you want. Uh, but there have been discussions about expansions of structures within the wetland where there is a structure between the expansion and the wetland edge. And that in that case, the expansion may be much more palatable than um, just the general 30% expansion of a structure as long as it doesn't get any closer to the wetland edge. So th that's another approach you, you could consider. But then one has to define how big that structure has to be in order to qualify as something that would be a mitigating Well, we have, we have a definition of structure in the ordinance. <coughs> Uh, and <coughs> you, you could define it as the, the width of the structure would have to be at least the width of the expansion. Uh, just as one board person, I, I, uh, I, I think if we can keep it as, as, as simple, I, I, to some, maybe I'm missing something entirely, but if it is in a certain buffer area, then, then in that area is all defined the same, then I can't understand. Um, how you get wetter in one place than, than another. 
is in, and we're going to start talking about degrees of wetness in, in wetlands. I, um, maybe I'm all wrong, but uh, maybe I'm all wet. But um, it does, does not uh, make sense to try to regulate it to that degree, I don't think. Any other comment? Uh, yeah, maybe Maureen could make this clear for <laughs> me also. Uh, the distinction between a house which is in the RP1 wetland and a house which is within the RP1 buffer, oh, where the line occurs that separates those two phenomena and what the what the height, what you might expect for hydrology, et cetera, for a house that's located in the buffer as opposed to actually in the wetland itself. That, that actually is probably one of the s most, what I consider one of the most successful portions of the wetlands regulations. There's a very clear definition of what is considered a critical wetland. A critical wetland is at least one acre of very poorly drained soils or at least one acre of uh, obligate wetland vegetation or land which is saturated for a period of time during the year. And uh, the way most people define the wetland is they don't bother with the wetland hydrology or with the, the vegetation. They just go and they have a uh, soils test done. And we get a soils map and there's a list in the ordinance that, that lists the most commonly found very poorly drained soils in Cape Elizabeth. You basically get your soils map, you pick out the very poorly drained soils and if there's at least an acre contiguous then um, you have a critical wetland. You then determine where the wetland is based on um, your traditional soils mapping techniques that are done by soil scientists. Where the edge changes from a very poorly drained soil to a poorly drained soil is where you define the critical wetland edge. At that point you may transition into a, you will definitely transition into a critical wetland buffer. Um, the buffer may also be in a, what we call our, an RP2 or a wetland protection zone. So the, the underlying zone may be wetland protection and the overlay is the buffer. The underlying zone could also be just a regular residential zone if you have a very quick transition from a very poorly drained soil to a non-wetland soil. Uh, you would then have a residential zone, but again, you're still in that buffer area. Uh, and then buffers are, are um, 250 feet in width, um, which can be reduced down to 100 feet in width under certain circumstances. So um, actually, the, especially the code enforcement officer and some of the soil scientists in the area have gotten very good at determining where that wetland edge is. Thank you. Any other comments? Questions? Again, going back, what is the consensus as far as taking the uh, the two definitions forward? Judy? Um, one board member, I'd like to see two alternatives offered. They can vary in wording. Remaining the same as they are worded here? Or they can be worded a little differently. I'd like the option of what we include in that computation. Okay. Any nods of the head and consensus? Steven? <coughs> I still would like to just leave it at one. Any others uh, want to keep it at one versus? Uh, I would like to keep it at one. Okay. Five, one, one, one. And uh, which one? Which one would that be? One. One, one. One, one. one. I guess the consensus of the board is to go forward with uh, simply. Um, the state shoreland zoning definition. And I assume that does not preclude board members from discussing other options. Absolutely not. No. Okay. We'll be back for discussion uh, after public hearing. That is okay. simply the definition that goes to okay. public hearing as, as part of the document. Uh, and it, do we, do we then not attempt to define, define floor area at this point in time, but then wait until public no. hearing to, to define exactly what is floor area? The floor area going to the, to the public hearing will be that of alternative one. Okay. Um, which is the same as the state definition. Okay. okay, any other changes? Okay, if not, I'd like, if we could have a motion, um, and I would ask right from the start, if it is the wishes of the person making the motion to recommend a public hearing, which you should, um, that you change that date to June 29th uh, in the motion. Judy. Sure. 
propose the following motion for the board to consider be it ordered that based on the materials submitted and the facts presented the proposed amendments to the wetlands regulations in the zoning ordinance be tabled to a special meeting of the planning board on june 29th 1993 at which time a public hearing shall be held it has been moved do i hear a second second it's been moved second. and seconded um the motion does not mention uh it mentions the um, proposed amendment as stands <coughs> without uh, mm -hmm. it, it it's okay it's I stand corrected oh. as with, with just one definition going forward any discussion no. seeing and hearing none all those in favor of the motion as read please raise your right hand <coughs> those opposed it is a vote Unanimous. Very good. As far as the uh, June 29th meeting, is there anybody that cannot make that? It'll be a seven o'clock meeting here, and it, it's a regular public meeting, uh, similar to this. Anybody that uh, knows that they can't make it? Okay. Well, quick question: Are We going to yeah. be, be able to advertise and get people here? Yes. Um, it, the question. public hearing has to be in the paper. Uh, legal ad has to be a week before the meeting um, in order to get a add in for next Tuesday I have to get it to the paper this Friday so we're all set. Okay. very good the next uh, item of business on the agenda under new business is the Viking nursing home edition request by Viking nursing home for the planning board review of a condition on the original site plan approval site plan review section 19-2-10 um, Due to a fairly new conflict uh, or through employment, uh, I have a, uh, through my employment, I have a, a conflict with uh, Ron Boutet, who was part of the application before I understand that um, technically not a, an owner as such of, of uh, Viking Nursing Home was part of the um, application before. Uh, I have to step down on this, and I would again ask Judy Lardner to take the chair. Thank you. Um, first again, I'd like to appoint, um, I guess, one, two, three, four, both associate members, Mr. Cotter and Mr. Marvin, to vote on this issue. Um, if we could start off with um, the applicant just briefly identifying, I think, if or how these architectural drawings differ from what was submitted before if they do okay my name is Dwayne Rancourt uh, they all I, my understanding of the plans that were presented at the planning board meeting and it was accepted the only stipulation was that they have the architectural stamp on them and be brought back with an architectural stamp on them I believe that was the the intent of the um, the change there has been no changes uh, since those plans were submitted back in December of 90 other than that we had we had the drawings done um, without an architectural stamp so these are what we saw a couple of years ago that's correct um, do any of the board members have comments no I would be willing to entertain a motion then. Yep. <coughs> motion for the board to consider. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the plans submitted by the Viking Intermediate Care Facility located on Scott Dyer Road to, a, to satisfy a condition placed on the original site plan approval be approved. Do I hear a second? Second. Um, one quick question. I think I know the answer. But um, can you tell me quickly what the status of the, the land and the easements that you were proposing to give to the town? Has anything happened with those yet? We transferred, uh, I think, something like three acres of uh, wetlands that were identified as wetlands uh, back in, I think, January of, of 91. And when we get our building permit, the remaining lands will be going to Cape Elizabeth Land Trust after we you know we have our building permits okay so we'll be transferring the, the remainder of that land at that time 
Okay, thank you. Um, all those in favor of the motion as read, please show by raising your right hand. All those opposed, show it as unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you again, Judy. The, uh, the next item of business under new business, um, we're actually 15 minutes ahead of schedule, um, is, uh, are the applicants here? Uh, okay. Any board members, uh, it's, it's unusual to start before our agenda item, it's, it's usual to start after, but not usually before. Uh, there are sometimes instances when all the people aren't here who may be interested in, in the article uh, or the item on the agenda. Uh, what's the wishes of the board to, to go ahead with the, uh, the item? Yes, let's proceed. Okay. Um, I, I guess that's okay. If I assume we might be discussing this for 15 minutes and then someone might come in by that point. I guess the only thing that, that um, should, should um, should guide us here is that, that we don't finish the discussion prior to the, the time of the agenda item starting. So that's still an agenda item. If, if we get there before 9 o'clock, then we simply will take a break and come back and ask if they're... Uh, actually, it's not open for public hearing, but they're, they're, um, there may be discussion. Do you see what I'm saying, mm -hmm. saying Steve? <coughs> no, I, no, I guess I don't. Okay. If it's not a public hearing... Um, it, it's not, um, and there is a note uh, as Maureen reminds me at the bottom that this says the times are approximate and so we're not yeah. overly responsible for uh, uh, anybody missing any information that's uh, discussed. Let's take up the next item. It's uh, Murray Drive Public Access Waiver requested by Mr. and Mrs. John Quirk for a public access waiver of Lot U-22, I'm sorry, Lot U-22-26 located in the area of Murray Drive, Rand Road, Scott Dyer Road, public access waiver Section 19-4-2B. Uh, the applicant is at the podium. If you could identify yourself, and perhaps if you could just give a give us a, a brief uh, uh, summary of, of your proposal. My name is Michael Hayes. I'm an architect with Gar and Associates in Scarborough. And I'm representing the Quirks in this submission. Um, included in our package was uh, a cover letter. Uh, stating our intent, which would be to uh, have a public access waiver granted for lot 26. And uh, there's an adjacent lot 42, um, which is part of the same purchase agreement. There was also a site plan that was submitted with it, uh, along with uh, various photographs supporting um, site distances and um, a soils um, an HHE form for on-site septic disposal in lieu of uh, going with public sewer system. Um, what we're looking to do is, is uh, and I can go through the cover letter with you if you wish, uh, to talk about all the items that we're, that we're looking to do. Uh, Actually, I think if you just keep your, your discussion in general, typically when we uh, discuss um, the public access waiver, um, it, it's, it's basically up to the board um, to, to how they'd like to proceed, but uh, I think in general, if you can just proceed through there and then, then as in, in the sake of saving perhaps some time, okay. uh, let it uh, be with the board members if they decide they have questions to ask. And maybe sure. just in summary, you can uh, try to skip through those. Okay. <coughs> um, the site plan was developed and uh, I met with um, uh, the town planner and the various officials, uh, Director of Public Works, the Fire Chief, uh, and the Code Enforcement Officer to come to arrive at this plan. Uh, basically, the only difference, uh, there are two comments that were added after the submission, which was to the Fire Chief had indicated that he would like to see the driveway instead of the indicated 16 feet that, was, that is shown on this plan. After he had re-reviewed the plan, he would like to see it 18 feet, which is a uh, which makes it a fire access lane. Uh, additionally, the owners would like to see um, that lot 42 
also be able to be accessed from uh, the fire access lane off from lot 26, thereby uh, keeping all access to both lots off from, off from Scott Dyer Road and from the corner of Grand Road and Murray Drive, which would serve as both lots. Uh, that's basically um, the request of the owners. This time I'd like to uh, open it up to the board, uh, both for questions or, or, or any suggestions on how you'd like to proceed with this. I think that sometimes with public access waiver requests, we, we get a general uh, gist of, of the issues that are most important to the board uh, right from the start, and typically the, the discussion centers around those issues. Stephen? Um, one comment, one question. Um, question first. The lot that's shown on the plan, I guess this is the Maureen, is this lot right here they're proposing to access from here as well? Um, you're talking about the second lot. The, the lot you, you're talking about right now um, has access off of, could have access right. off of Scott Dyer Road. It's my understanding that the owner of, that the, the, the applicant is, would be the owner of both properties. And it is their wish that that second lot also have access off the driveway. Um, that's why there's a <coughs> condition recommended that, that that be addressed at this time. I should I should raise the issue that um, uh, Tom Emery has has questioned whether that that road should actually be going where it's going and whether perhaps both lots should have access off of Scott Dyer Road directly. Well, um, okay. Now time for comment. I have walked the site. Um, much prior to uh, the submission, um, and it seems to me, for having walked it, um, the access as proposed makes more sense than access from Scott Dyer Road. The site distance on Scott, Scott Dyer Road is not nearly as good, and I think it would be just one more um, possibly unsafe condition. And it's very pretty piece of land in there, and I think if it's the driveway is kept sort of winding and going through the woods, accessing both lots, it makes a lot of sense to me. Other comments or questions? Judy? Um, just a, I guess the general question, and I don't know whether the applicant or Maureen would answer this. I know there is a history of use um, primarily by school children is cut through from, I guess, Murray and Rand Road out to Scott Dyer. My first question would be is I'm not sure if that entire cut through follows this applicant's property or actually goes through Thomas Atwell's land and comes out in that second kind of right of way opening on Scott Dyer that is to the east of the this other one in question. Do you does anyone know where the pedestrian traffic is right now? Um, if I may uh, most of the children in the area go down uh, Rand Road and then cut down to the painted crosswalk that gets you across Scott Dyer Road to the school property. There is um, a, this particular piece right here uh, also goes through, this is Mr. Atwell's driveway, and this is also used uh, as a footpath by a lot of the children from this area to get, to get to Scott Dyer Road area also. Uh, so. Yes, this is part of this is used by some of the children to walk, and they go down through Mr. Atwell's driveway uh, and get up the Scott Dyer Road area and then cut across or walk down. Um, the configuration, I think, on the the tax maps of the zoning map or something, even though it shows a Butters is owning a right of way, it implies that there was some sort of right of way through there, Maureen. Um, is there any public interest that you know of in um, any configuration for Murray and Rand Road through to Scott Dyer Road? Um, I checked this with uh, the code enforcement officer and then with the uh, town assessor, and it's their knowledge that uh, this is not a paper street, this is Murray Drive. It's, it's um, a private drive. Um, and in fact, if you, if you look towards the left of the plan, you'll see um, a piece of property that's uh, noted to be belong to Emil Mosher. Apparently, this was also originally part of Murray Murray Drive, and uh, 
it was conveyed to the lot that is now owned by Arthur Lamb so that that lot would be buildable. So there, there's a history of this being treated as a private road and that there is no record of this ever being recorded as any kind of a road with some public rights in it. Okay. Um. I guess that was my question. It, it'd be nice to preserve any rights that the public has to that. If there are no rights, I don't know what we can do about that. I'll follow the question. But I, maybe I didn't understand that the, that the land that shows on our uh, plot is owned, being owned by Emil Mosier is actually part of another lot. Has that been conveyed to you, you mentioned Lamb, Arthur yeah. Lamb? My understanding is that the, the piece that's owned by Emil Mosher is is attached to the piece that's owned by Arthur Lamb. And but they're under two different ownerships. On, on this plan, yes. Um, but Do you know if, if that's under one ownership now? That I don't know. You're asking if Mr. Mosher's land has been sold to Mr. L to Mr. Mm -hmm. Lamb. That I don't know. Is that correct? Okay. Um, Okay. That makes sense. Um, is this a request for one lot or two lots on public access way? Uh, it is a request for lot 26 to have a public access waiver. And evidently, um, af after the submission, uh, it was also asked by the owners that lot 42 uh, be allowed to access off from the lot 26 act, uh, access waiver also. So, I, Maureen, I don't know how that is. Perhaps, Maureen, if you could make well, that more clear. Well, I was told by the code enforcement officer that the lot that you have in front of you that is referenced to be owned by Martha Durant's, because it has 46 feet of frontage on Scott Dyer Road, it doesn't need a public access waiver. Uh, public access waivers are needed if you have insufficient frontage and you don't have to access the lot from the same place where you get your waiver. Does that make sense? What is the standard that gives you adequate frontage? Uh, it's under the non-conforming lots of record. I believe the standard is 45 feet. That's why the lot that, that you're looking at right now has 40, 40 feet of frontage on Rand Road. So it's, it's just missing and, and the, the other lot just has enough. You can see that one tapers wider. It goes to. Uh, I assume that was intentional. But does it require a public access waiver if they if they don't access from? No. Okay. So it it really is a uh, public access waiver for one existing lot, lot 26. Okay. If if the board were to attach a condition to to the other lot. Um, th you're in a unique position to do that because the, the applicant owns both lots at this time. Once um, the lot is transferred and there are separate owners, there then becomes a, a, a need to negotiate between two people in order to use the driveway of one. Whereas if you do it right now, um, you don't have to worry about those kind of uh, problems with having to get um, the owner of one lot to have to purchase or somehow negotiate an agreement with the owner of the other lot to use the driveway. Judy. But what we're proposing is to simply allow access over that driveway and not require access. If someone wanted to come in over Scott Dyer Road on Lot 42, we're not prohibiting that. Uh, under the proposed that. condition, you are prohibiting that. We are prohibiting that. Yes. Uh, you're saying under the proposed condition, condition that, that uh, is in our write-up. So in essence, it's not a request for for public access waiver for one lot, it really is by condition for both. Two. I mean, it, it technically, it's mm -hmm. not a request for two because usually people ask for a public access waiver because they have to in order to make the lot buildable. Mm -hmm. um, if if this lot does not have access on the other lot's driveway, it's still buildable. Mm -hmm. so, okay. But would that prevent them from? I don't know what the situation is with the ownership. If they were to potentially sell this lot, can they grant an easement across their own driveway without having come to back come back to us? Yes, they can. Okay. So what, I don't understand what the big problem is. I guess I just wanted to make sure that if someone changes their mind and would rather access from Scott Dyer Road, that we're not prohibiting something. 
but if if that's what the applicant is requesting, then I guess it's okay. Mark? That was my question. Uh, is, um, is an access easement for lot 42 part of this application or, or a condition of this application? I would say it's only by condition. It's okay. not a requirement. Is that right? Correct. I got it right the third time. <laughs> I, the, the most important comment that I have is is really a, a public health issue dealing with um, subsurface uh, sewer treatment. Um, I realize that it is the the town's ordinance that that really circumvents its uh, ability to be hooked up to to sewer. I just uh, as one board member, I, I think it's uh, I, I can't think of the right descriptive term. A shame. Uh, that here in a neighborhood that is surrounded by lots that are all hooked to sewer mm -hmm. uh, in a reasonably high density area um, that because of the town ordinance were required a, a fairly archaic um, method of sewer disposal uh, pumping it on the ground. Uh, it doesn't go away. It, uh, uh, septic systems fail. Um, I don't know, and Maureen, I, I I did have a chance to talk to Maureen a, a couple of days ago. Um, did you check with, with uh, Bob O'Malley any further? Yeah, the, the reason this can't get a uh, sewer, it's, it's not eligible for a sewer permit. And the reason it's ineligible for a sewer permit is it doesn't have enough frontage on a road that does have sewer. So there is sewer in, in Rand Road, and if the applicant could get a permit, they could connect up at that point. Um, but our ordinance prohibits them getting a permit. Can you state specifically what what prevents them from because uh, they don't have the, the they don't ha Yeah, the, under our current ordinance, it's uh, the intent of the of the sewer ordinance was to be growth neutral. That is, that if you could um, sewer, if you could provide private s disposal for your lot, that. Uh, then you could get sewer as well, but that the presence of sewer would not encourage areas that would not otherwise be developed. And one way they, they dealt with that is um, they, they allowed sewer permits to be issued only if you had frontage on a road that had sewer and you had to have a minimum amount of frontage, and this lot does not have enough frontage um, on a road that has sewer. It has some frontage, but not enough. Okay, so lot 42 does not have enough frontage either? That's correct. Right. <laughs> so we're potentially looking at two septic systems in a, in a sewer neighborhood. That's uh, not it's ludicrous, actually. Um, is there a remedy um, <coughs> placing as a condition the, upon the failure of, of um, the new systems that Condition upon a change in the ordinance that they be required to hook up to sewer? I don't see why you, you couldn't put that condition on there. Yeah, it's like this last ditch effort <laughs> of a <laughs> diehard uh, sewer fan. Did you pursue anything with the Board of Sewer Appeals? No. No. Yeah. I did, uh, Bob Malley and, and myself walked both sites and, uh... If it, if it were made available, if a permit could be, um, obtained, would the applicant, uh, prefer to hook to sewer? I never broached that subject because we were told that we'd have to go through appeals. So, I don't know if you... It's never come up. Yeah, it has never. Once Bob, once Mr. Malley told us that we didn't have the amount of frontage and that we'd have to go to the sewer board for an appeal <coughs> and it could not be done in a timely enough fashion for this meeting, uh, it was, we hustled to get the, uh, the uh, on-site septic work done. Yeah. Any other discussion? Jay? Um Just two general comments. Mr. Emery typically makes um, comments about lots that are tucked in behind others as being something he dislikes. Um, I won't speak for him here, but I'd like to say that given 
the configuration of some long ago road that has ceased to exist, these lots seem different to me and more acceptable than other ones we've seen in the past. I don't know if anyone agrees with that. The second comment is because there is a history of child and other pedestrian use, which apparently has been illegal or trespassing <coughs> to date, that perhaps any um, residents in that area might be able to talk to the new owners of Lot 26 and perhaps Mr. Atwell, if need be, and perhaps they can still use that as a cut through. But I could suggest that to anyone who's concerned about preserving that. Other than that, I have no concerns. Okay. Any other comments? Stu? I have a motion. <coughs> I, I, I'd just like to wait and make one last stab at it, just so I can see if I have any following on the board at all. Uh, to placing condition uh, upon failure of, of uh, existing or new sy septic systems that they, uh, upon change in the ordinance, a favorable change in the ordinance, uh, they'd be required to hook to sewer. Any other board members feel that way? For what it's worth, yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay, I, just a little discussion here. I mean, is that even realistic to assume that those, the sewer, laws or guidelines or whatever are going to change for the better in the future? We, the planning board started in 1990 in, in serious discussion with, with the town council and has continued since and, and the town council agrees in concept uh, or at least philosophy, uh, philosophy that the original intent of um, the negative growth or I'm sorry that's my own Freudian slip. Neutral growth um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, neutral growth uh, intent of the sewer <coughs> ordinance um, it was not correct. It didn't work. It didn't. It didn't serve the purpose that it was <laughs> intended to fulfill. The town council has, has taken no further action. There's been a lot of talk, but no action since since 1990, uh, and probably prior to that. Um, I started on the board in 1989. It was an issue at that time. I remember one of the first, uh, the first uh, articles that came up, it was an issue at that time. Just, just to one update, the, the council has referred the whole issue to the Board of Sewer Appeals. and